Hello everyone, welcome to this first edition of Karakana Creative Dialogues. At Karakana, we hope to give young artists and creatives an opportunity to learn, to share, to be mentored and to have fun. In this first edition, we are going to discuss creative writing from the perspective of very experienced and knowledgeable writers. We hope you'll enjoy this show. Karibu sana. With an art student and seeing all that, uh, one of the biggest problems we have is because actually guys don't care. I think we artists are the only ones who care about ourselves. <laughs> I think if there is one thing that um, not just writers, many, many of us artists need is uh, that boldness to step out of some comfort zone. Um, and it takes all that from the branding that you mentioned, from the point at where you look at someone in the eye and say, I want to make money. Is it true that we don't have a reading culture? We have a reading culture. Although it's, it's, it's uh, particularly in the urban centers. Because if we talk about who knows Wanja Kavengi, who's heard of Biko Zulu, yeah. who's heard of... If we didn't have a, a reading culture, we would not have those guys selling secondhand books in every street in town, like continually thriving. So we do have a reading culture. It's just that it hasn't, it's not sana sana in... Uh, Machinani. My answer to that question is it doesn't matter and I do not you, care. You don't care. Yeah. yeah. I don't care if you are a reader or a writer. I just need to create a product that will be irresistible to you. Okay. That's it. Okay. So the, and that's what Butter did when they came to Kenya. You all know the story of Butter. They sent the first marketer. The guy was like, dude, those guys don't wear shoes. Let's we care. we don't have a, a you know, we don't have any chance there. Then the second guy was like, chill. Um they don't have shoes. It means we can put a shoe on all those one billion people. And that's exactly what Butter did. Okay. So I don't care if Kenyans are writers or not. I don't care if you, can, if you read or not. Mm. I'm just going to create a product and mm. sell it to you. <laughs> when, we look at, when we look at the entire ecosystem, yes. Yes. all that we are talking about is not just about books. It's not just about your talent. It's not about writing. It's about a bigger, deeper historical injustice that you personally break. need to break out from intentionally and that sadly won't be done by a group of people that's an individual decision that you need to make so it doesn't matter if you join as many groups as you want to yeah. you have mm -hmm. to make a personal decision to know who you are but if you can discover yourself right now discover your voice you, you discover your fatuma's voice discover all that has been hidden inside that you've never had the opportunity to share and now bring that out I think that's what we should be talking about right now. Okay. And whatever it is that you write, I will buy. Because it comes from a mindset that is out of a prison. So it's so interesting that you're saying that. Because three weeks ago, I attended a forum. Um, I'm very much into the entrepreneurship space. And one of the things that came out was Kenyans are so unconfident about their things. I attended Sentonomi. Washukandwati, one, one thing she talks about is that the reason that America is what it is today is because of its brands. When we hear Coca-Cola, when we hear Hollywood, when we hear Levi's jeans, we just get flabbergasted. And she's like, where are the Kenyan brands? Which is a Kenyan brand colo freaking colonizing the world? And I just kept on sitting there. I'm like, you know, it's true. I, as a Kenyan, with all my global experience, like I still feel, I don't know, like I still don't have that confidence that I can just wake up and, Minanda, Sijui, Denmark, I'm going to start my startup. And one year later, they will be praising me as Forbes top do what you know and they I mean like we have foreigners coming to do it yeah but why aren't we doing it and it is so related that 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 is so very very related but just another thing that came out was uh I think we need to have regular brag meets as writers because Chris we are one thing that's really lacking is confidence define brag meets. like like I think we need to have a space where we we say that every month you have to go out and do something that you have to come and brag about. Like, like just like go, go and come back and say, brag, I did this. I managed to do this. I sold 50 books. Like, it's, it's just because I think we're too, we're too modest and we, uh, we, don't, we, we are at our place. Our self-esteem is not strong enough. Our, our self-esteem is not strong enough that... We don't have that. You know how Nigerian writers, eh? They, they have, you, you can see them, you know, Nigerian writer. Ask Kenyan writers is that we are like, yeah, I'm a writer. Exactly what she's talking about, the self-efficacy of Kenyans, the, 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 the way we view ourselves and all that. Even if someone is actually, you know, as good as he says he is, I kid you not, there's a, there's an, uh, you know, there's a, a runner who's won gold six times. 
put them in front of a camera and they can't even say their name. Not, I'm not talking about pronunciation. They can't even look at you in the eye. And I'll tell you where that goes back to. It goes back to our education system. Um, any people with questions before I make my comments? Any questions? Hands up. Uh -huh, we've got one. Uh, David, two. Uh, three. Okay. Uh, I think let's start with the lady. Always remember to introduce yourself, then you can give that to Lupia there. So why is it that as writers and creatives we think, I will only write and create that which I care about? I think we just need to stop framing ourselves that all I do, as Kingwa said, I only write this kind of stuff. No. You can write advertising copy, you can write native ads, there's a lot that you can write where there's a need for it. So I agree with you that it's for you to create the need. Uh, one, one quick question again, just again to the team. Do we do what we think is ideal or what Kenyans really want and need? If we are to teach a class, for example, how many Kenyans are writing academic papers around here? Because sometimes part, I mean, there's a difference between the, the structure of academic writing, but at the end of the day, it's all about communication. So if we can teach people how to structure papers well, how to structure even creative writing well, features and the rest, I don't think that there's a problem with the creative industry in Kenya, if you ask me as a fellow creative. I think it's the way we view the work that we do. Architects don't draw the houses that they want to draw. When you're starting out as an architect, man, you'll draw that brick house if it's what is going to pay the bill. So can we reframe it and say, there's no industry that allows you when you're starting out to fully create your own space. You're the one who starts with what you can. You create a name for yourself. You create a need for your services. So again, I ask us, do we really have a problem with the creative industry in Kenya or have we not framed the problem correctly? Uh, my name is Amavin. I'm an artist and I've studied, I've studied architecture. So first, I want to talk about the issue of monetization. A lot of the industries that you've talked about, like law, architecture, everybody lives in a house. Everybody needs law at one point in time. But you see with, with writing, actually a lot of people don't read. I said reading books shortly after I self-published a book last year. So before that I hadn't read a book in like four, four years. But you'll except find Except textbooks in school, yeah? Yeah, yeah, except textbooks in schools which are boring. But you'll find like somebody like because Zulu, because Zulu, I know because Zulu and his famous cause, I like spending time on social media, Facebook. So, as in him, I think he started with social media and small posts. Because I like wasting time on social media. Eventually, I land on his, his stuff and waste a few minutes. But how many times will I go to a, to a bookstore to find your book and spend maybe 800 bob to waste time reading your book, you see? So you have to put it in a place where I'll, I'll find it or I'll see it. Then again, guys have to understand that writing is an art. For example, like in visual arts, as in art is a luxury. Nobody wants to have that painting in their house, except they want to impress somebody else, or they really love art, or they want to use it to, to, to brag about how cultured they are. But, and most of the times, people read some books to brag about how cultured they are, but it's a luxury. Nobody is going to go out and feel, oh, I need a painting in my house or something, because at the end of the day, people need food, people need houses, people need a lot of things. And I used to introduce myself as an artist in front of people a lot of times, and people like, oh, Nachoranga, you're poor. The minute I... <laughs> The minute I introduced myself as somebody who's studied architecture and they can draft a house, everybody's like, ah, nikona kanyumba nataka kuchorewa. So the conversation changes. Everybody needs a house, but nobody needs a book. We need books to read, but nobody's going to be like, oh, I really need to read a book. Except unless they are a reader themselves or they are a writer. So it's a luxury. We have to understand that writing in itself is a luxury. So what she said about making it in a, in a way that guys can actually consume it. For example, guys, companies need to sell stuff. So they need writers to write about things, to sell those things. In the same way, in art, companies need uh, graphic design, posters, stuff, stuff like that. If you're going to rely purely on just making art that is visually appealing to Kenyans who don't even like, who don't even appreciate art in, from the get-go, chances are you're going to starve. So how do you go from thinking that the only way to become a wealthy writer is just basically writing things that guys are like, oh, I really need to read that thing because I'm like, oh, oh, I really need to read that because if I don't read it again, I won't sleep very well. Guys will never do that, you see. So then again, there's the issue of shock value. 
if you want to be a very famous writer, take for example in the visual arts sector, guys like Damien Hurst, guys who put a dead shark in a tank full of formaldehyde now is worth a billion dollars worldwide as one of the richest living artists. Guys like Jeff Koons who painted pictures of their naked wives who are actually porn stars and became like $400 million worth. What is the shock value? How are you going to shock Kenyans? Because Kenyans don't have a reading culture. They only like getting shocked by 50 shades of gray, then they'll go and read 50 shades of gray. So how are you going to shock the Kenyans into reading your book? Because they're not going to be like, oh, that book is so flowery, that book is so nice, I really need to read it. Guys won't read it. Second is, we need to change how we think we are monetizing our art. Make money from a different side do what you love doing. Make so much money that you can force it down people's throats because you have the money to do so. Get a billboard, put your flowery book on that billboard, sell that, billboard, that book until guys get tired of looking at billboards with that book. <laughs> but that is because you've made your art from somewhere else. Second, I don't see how you can talk about a society that does not have a free mind in a sense, free thinkers, and still at the same time, in the same sentence, say you're not writing books about revolution because guys are not confident because they are colonized and we are still this is still neo-colonialism going on so okay. who stops you from writing a book about revolution and at the same time writing your flowery book and at the same time writing for the corporates and forcing that flowery book of yours down people's throats and forcing the same revolutionary book down other people's throats so that's my question as in you can't talk Great. about free thinking and, revolu and, dis and removing revolution from the conversation in the same breath doesn't make sense. Uh, okay, okay. Let's give him a hand. I think uh, he's got some new insights. Um, is there another question so that we just flag it before we come to Tabitha and uh, Gabriel? I want you guys to talk about the strength of working in teams uh, because one of the things even my, myself I'm very passionate about his associations and people working in groups. So where's the question? Please stand up, introduce yourself. Yes. Yeah, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Narissa. Um, I'm from Nairobi, even though my accent is a mix of five accents. Um, so I, I run a travel blog um, about backpacking, social causes, conscious art, spirituality. Um, alternative spirituality, that is. And um, actually, so as I was building, as I was deciding to, I, I've run um, a blog for fun for the last four years, and then uh, towards the end of last year, I decided I wanted to start monetizing it. Um, so as I was making that decision towards the end of last year, I was sort of toying between going through Medium um, and having my own blog. And then so I asked a few friends, and then I just decided to do my own, so... Oh, yeah, my blog is called nomadgirltales.com. I forgot to mention that. So I decided to go that route. I got my domain name, and I started my new blog, and I've, um, I've got all my... So I'm just wondering, actually, my question is, I just wanted to ask, you know, people who are, you know, advanced in all this, being full-time writers, about what your thoughts are on Medium, actually, as a platform to publish through. Do you think it's a good idea, or... Um, you know, going through Medium versus having your own um, site to publish through. Yeah, thanks. Now, in business, they say when you think of a product, you have to go out into the market and uh, interview your potential customers and see if it's a product they like. Are you suggesting that we do the same with our writing? There are so many opportunities. But um, even in my industry, which I uh, have been for a long time, photography, we have even been told, you know, let me give you an example. There are guys who don't photograph uh, uh, funerals, eh? David, you know, guys who don't photograph funerals, because I have been one of them. Other guys, we say we don't photograph certain things because they look like it's bad photography. It doesn't look like it's, um, it's classy, you get. But then... The things you really want to do cost money, a lot of money. So go and make money doing sometimes boring the academic writing or whatever other kind of writing work. Make the money and then do what you really love. And that which you really love eventually, I believe, should be able to define you. Okay, It becomes your style, it becomes your signature, it becomes your identity. And uh, that could be perhaps one of the things that uh, we want to pursue. I think you want to say something. Uh, and also we'll come back to Tavida so that she can tell us, especially those of you who are starting, how can you find your, 
your niche. You know, you're wondering, I've got all this in front of me, but how do you make progress as you narrow down and uh, head towards exactly what you want to write about? So let's start with him, then we'll come back to you. First of all, you made the right decision for creating your own blog. So, but they just clap for her for that. And the reason I'm saying that is because you own that content 100%. If you put your content on Medium, you do not own it. If Medium crashes today, it goes with your content. Same with any other, any other you know, platform you may want to use. Uh, yeah, even, but YouTube, even YouTube. Yeah, yeah, if even it YouTube. Crashes, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it goes with all your content, with all your one million views and all that stuff. So the reason why it's good for you to host your content in your own home is because you can choose to do whatever you want with it. Once you put up a blog on... on um, on the nomadgirltales.com, right? You can share half of it on Medium and then put a link back to your blog. Yes, really, yeah, yeah. You can actually do that. And that way you get, you get the audience of your own blog plus the audience that's already on Medium. And that's what you definitely do with all the other social media platforms. And so, like, I think this just definitely needs its own its own seating, uh, uh, but if yes. you want, if you want to, if anyone here wants to learn how to monetize their content, whether it's a hard copy book, how to sell that, whether it's a soft copy book, how to sell that, whether it's an online training training session, how to sell that, because all these, everyone here is supposed to be on uh, such a platform, but apparently only two people are signed up to an online training platform. So monetizing is a whole, you know, that we can get into, but you did the right, you made the right choice. There is no one statement I can make to cover all the writers in Kenya or in the world with regards to what you just asked, because I know there are people who wake up, put together a few words, and it's a bestseller. Ask Miguna about peeling back the mask. So, and there are so many other examples, but there are other people who actually go down and do the serious research and you know, go deep into the details of, of all that. So it all depends on you as a person and what you want. At the end of the day, it's not really about other people. So don't think so much about other people. Think of yourself, what's your vision? Like what are you trying to achieve? Does whatever you're doing feed into that? So what I'll say from a marketing point of view is that the best way to, to do it, or rather, or rather what I will do is I will, I would look for, I will, I will look at the audience I'm targeting, like uh, what he suggested. I'll look at the audience and find out what are the loopholes, or what, rather what are the things they, they need. And then I'll create that product for them. But there's a problem to that, and that's why I don't want to give it as a blanket statement, that you, you, know, you go do research and find out what people want, and then you give it to them. Sometimes you just need to create some new you know, stuff and just give it to people. Um, it's all about it's all about uh, you know how creative you are and how how your intuition and how your you know your, your your forward thinking and all that. So it depends on so many things. Though there is no one particular way to do it. And um, I'll give you a brief example, uh, if you allow me, of what we did with, with there's a there's a, a book we, we we put together. It's a collection and an anthology of poems. It's called The Power of Words. Uh, it didn't, we didn't really sell so many copies here in Kenya, and very few people know about it. But that book helped uh, help fund our entire organization when we were starting. And how that happened is that um, in uni in the, I was at the University of Nairobi, so I, I put together a couple of poets, and I was like, hey, I have this great idea. It's called Fatuma's Voice. I want to put it together. I want to see what you can do with this. And they were like, uh, how can we support you? I was like, well, I need money. <laughs> but hey, these are students, and... That's a, that's, a, that's a hard call for students. So I was like, how about you, you, donate, you make donations in the form of your poems? And so that, I, made a, I did a crowdfunding of poetry. So they sent their poems, I compiled them into a book, then I, do, did, I did a tour. I sold the book in, I've sold the book in India, I've sold it in the US, and actually there was a forum I was given to speak like this in the US, um, and I sold each book I had, it was worth $5, but I sold it at $50 per copy. Because I told them of the vision I have for this book. This book is not just a book you're holding. This is, the, this is Fatuma's voice. This is, is going to give a voice to so many other people. And so people are not just buying the book, but they were buying the vision. So it depends on so many other things. And if you want, you know, maybe if you have a specific product you want, we could talk about that and I could share more. Um, so just to touch on one of the things you said, um, in terms of 
not being able to sell your product. So you yourself said you've come up with a book, right? Okay, but when you were creating the book, did you think of who this book is for? Did you do a survey on the people who might read this kind of book? Are they in Nairobi, are they elsewhere, are they international, that kind of thing? Promoting yourself as a, as a writer and being able to connect with your audience, one of the things you have to do is find your tribe. So if you're a horror writer, go and find the Horror Society of Kenya. There actually is a Horror Society of Kenya. No, wait. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you're trying to write a book about a romance or a sensual thriller, go and post things on Kilimani Moms. Simple. So you have to connect to the audience that is the intended audience for your books. So th th that's one of the big problems. People will write a book, but then they're pitching it to the wrong person. I did a survey on African literature with people who have been part of my following just to ascertain what kind of stuff they like reading, whether it's short stories, uh, long novels, and the majority was short stories, so that's the audience you may find it easier to appeal to. Um, th there's a very important part that you've said. You're an artist when you're creating, so then the creating part process ends and the business process begins. Yes. Because you must either sell your book or monetize your website for adverts or get uh, likes on your posts before you monetize into something else and all that. That's a very important part for us to note that there is a part A, creating, and part B, the business side. So you must go for training on business and attend workshops and go online and uh, sign up for e-learning platforms and things like that. Um, tell us about, uh, just pass the mic, about um, some of the advantages that you have had with your over 200, well, that's a big number, women, and what are some of the strengths that you have in being in such a group like uh, Maple, Brook, Maple Brook writers, and what are some of the gains that you have seen in that? Okay, writing is a very lonely journey. I'm sure all of us know that. And you know, like we say, write, to write is that is a verb. We all want to write. You ask anybody, have you written a book? Yes, I'm thinking about writing. But the process is what really takes long. So for us, as, a, as Maple Brook writers, we keep each other accountable. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a vision board. We, uh, we created our vision boards and we were putting our goals together and saying, by this time, we need to have our books out. By this time, we need to have our blogs ready. We need to be posting at this time of the week. So really, for, for me, working with others has helped in accountability and making our vision boards come to pass. A niche is a, an area of specialization or an area of interest. Uh, many times when we are starting to write, we are not sure about what to write about. So um, I use an acronym called SHAPE. I don't know how many have heard about the SHAPE tool. SHAPE tool, anybody? SHAPE is an acronym that stands for the S is for the spiritual gifting. So I ask the person to write down what is your gift. Uh, is it training? Is it teaching? Is it gift of wisdom? So you begin to figure out what is it that you're good at. And then we have the H is the heart. What is it uh, you're passionate about? What do you like naturally? Is it cooking? Is it talking? Is it eating? Whatever you like to do naturally. Then we have A, ability. Ability is actually a skill that you've acquired. Like for me, my background is IT. I did my first degree in IT, and I did a master's in IT, and I'll be doing a PhD in IT. So I've written a lot about IT. I've done call for papers. Uh, I've done so much technical papers. So that is also my niche. And I also love family. Like I told you, my books are about family. So my two areas are technology and family. Then uh, we have the PP's uh, personality, uh, and I'm sure we know the four different types of personalities. We have the sanguines, like our president there, and uh, we have the melancholies, who are cool, calm, and collected. We have the cholerics, who are goal-oriented, goal, who are goal and we have the phlegmatic. So you look at yourself and you figure out who am I exactly, so that will determine what you're going to write about. Like I'm sure some of the things she was talking about, if you're phlegmatic or melancholy, you'll really struggle writing about them. Uh, and then we have the E, which is the experience. Your good and bad experiences will guide you on what you want to write about. They'll give you something to write about. So that will help you discover what you're meant to be writing. And I always say, if you want to really know what you're good at, just take five minutes and write ten topics about it. If you can't come up with uh, ten topics in five minutes, then really you're going to struggle writing your book. I agree with all this. And 
by no, uh, this is the starting point. But what we really encourage regarding you finding your niche, if at all you should find it, do something. Just do something. If it is writing, just write something. You know, you can just write what is close to you then. Maybe someone will give you an idea, will tell you, ah, what if you would have done this? Then it gives you another idea. You can just do another thing. With many things you do, you will finally find something that where your heart will rest, like home. Uh, I know we are in another platform and uh, King came guns blazing about politics and some of the things that are going wrong in this country. Um, and earlier you talked about your 15-year journey and uh, it's like going full circle and in as much as you want to make money, I think most likely making money perhaps is up on the priorities. But then there are issues you're addressing. There is an audience. You know, you have your club of horror, <laughs> horror association of Kenya. Um, I think once you should be a sex association of Kenya. <laughs> you know, and even that's in fact the separation of you know uh, the president and the author and the scholar and the writer. How how do you get into? Does it mean that all, especially the ones who are starting here, have to go through 15 years? Um, the, to discover what they want to talk about, the issues they want to address, the people, the audience, they want your writing, whether it's a book or online, you want to address? No, absolutely not. I think every writer's journey is different. Um, some start writing and get published in their teens, others in their 20s. Um, people like Toni Morrison, I think she's, her first book came out when she was, I think, 38 or in her 40s. The writers who started in their 50s and 60s. And there's one you told me who was uh, discovered after she died. Yeah, yeah, Emily Dickinson. We know her, right? The poet. Like, she wrote thousands and thousands of poems, but thousands of writing and hiding under her, her mattress. So, like, every writer has their own journey. Um, and so just trust. You have to trust your journey. You have to trust your process. And I want to, in, re in relation to this... Um, one of the questions that has been coming out about the role of art today and why it is sort of like looked down, sort of, it's not, so there's a, there's a, there was, I was listening to someone on YouTube yesterday talking about how there was a time the arts were like way more elevated than how science and technology is right now. Like the artists, Kina Michael Angelo, Kina whatever's, you know, that age of Russian writers when, I haven't been to Russia, it's one of my dream countries, but apparently in Russia, like the roads are named after the writers, like and all that. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, so th there's, there's, a TED, there's a talk, there's a talk, it's called, it's on YouTube, it's called What It Means to Be an Entertainer, Art Talks with Duffman. So if, you have, if you're interested to follow up about that, just read about it. And he references um, a, a, another, another uh, person who talks about why humans run the world. And really what the guy is saying, what the gist of it is the, is the, power, is the role of art in evolving mankind. Like, and especially the role of art in the evolution of the imagination. And that, so he, he, he talks about it in a way that we are at a point right now when we need that kind, we need, we need another like face of moving forward, another way of looking at ourselves. So, just check it out. Just listen to it yourself, um, and it'll help you understand why you're doing what you're doing, um, and answer again questions about voice and and time and speed and everything. When you were talking earlier, uh, Mutende, you mentioned about how even the government tries to shut us down. You want to grab the mic and just mention it a little bit. Um, don't worry, they won't come for you. Uh, but but there is a way that uh, you're trying to reference to history about the arts being um, like they're trying to keep us on a leash because if we go out then... This is my perspective on things, having done surveys, interacted with a bunch of artists and so on uh, from different age groups. So when it comes to art as a commodity, as a product, it's not something that you can physically hold. And the problem that we have with the, as I say, proletariat, the people in the government, right? is they've based their power on physical and tangible resources, whether it's stealing land, um, whether it's controlling the service providers like uh, telecom companies or electricity companies. Um, now, 
what a lot of the youth are left with is arts and they're, they're being driven into arts. Um, and as a pushback, you have people who are coming and trying to be moral police, but when the money's good, they ignore the morals. Um, Ezekiel Mutua did this the other day when someone he, who's from the community he, he rants against showed up with a bunch of money, had no problem chauffeuring the guy around. Uh, but if it's a local scenario, he tries to downplay it. Um, and that's the big thing. So there needs to be a way that um, artists, and this is what this is about, artists can control their own um, start to finish. So, so from conception to distribution to getting your money without government interference. And then we can find, as artists, some way of getting liberated from acid-based suppression. Um, Writers Guild? Are oh. you guys by the uh, Writers? Are you an association? Well, we are a trust uh, of writers. Okay. Uh -huh. Keep going. Um, allow me, Steve, not to mention the benefits, but ask Munira Hussein, who was introduced to me in 2014 in Kenyatta University. I saw Gikonyo. Gikonyo said he attended our first meeting on 13th of September 2014. I would wish to ask Munira, who was introduced to me around that time, to tell us briefly in 30 seconds or a minute the benefit which she has had. You could be able to mention the travels and the journeys we've gone to Mombasa until you released your book. Hi, uh, my name is Munira Hussein. I am a microbiologist. I went to school and studied microbiology, but I'm an author of Unfit for Society. Um, publish, publish. Hands, hands, please. I mean, yeah. When I joined the Writers Guild, I was uh, in KU. It was a club in KU then. Uh, but I was studying microbiology, so I wanted a, a, a writer's group to connect with. And um, it was some sort of, I didn't even realize there are so many opportunities in writing until I came to meet all this group of writers who are doing the same thing as I was. But then, uh, back then, I just had my short poems or short stories in, handwritten in books, not knowing what to do with them. The amazing thing with Writers Guild is we have forums like this where people, we, Gabriel used to bring people from publishing houses, um, media houses, so we got to interact with all these people to see how uh, what they are doing, what they want. And that's how I got the opportunity to write the new curriculum books for Longhorn Publishers. And now I'm writing for several uh, blog companies' content for blogs. All of them opportunities that I got through the Writers Guild. So I'm thinking if I had not taken that step to join a writer's community, I wouldn't have known there are so many opportunities in writing. Okay, okay. And even my launch was uh, uh, organized by Writers Guild of Kenya, and we had uh, a great turnout, and the sales were amazing, and it's, it's been going great so far. There's been reviews, and I think that community creates some sort of uh, a safety, net a safety and, uh, and plus it's also, you, you just, you know you're, you're not doing this alone, because when you're a writer, you're writing from your house or from wherever, and it's not like a community, you don't go to an office and say, we all work here, it's just you doing the creating. Munira Hussein is, um, I would say, is an embodiment of writers. The step where we are, I remember in 2014 when I was introduced to Munira by one of my team members, then called Max. You know, Munira used to write poems and perform poems. But then when she came, then she became the head of the Poets in Writers Guild and we started organizing trainings at KCA University here in town and at i &M building so other people would come. Then I remember when we went with Munira to Rabai High School in Coast and uh, that is the point when uh, uh, the, English, uh, the teacher of English in that school asked us for our work. And I think it is at that point when we thought we could be able to do an anthology of poems. And Munira worked with other people to put up an anthology of poems called The Journey of Hope. Then Munira went and keep, kept going and served in a magazine in uh, Kenyatta University, a Career Week magazine, which uh, we had gotten the contract to do as Writer's Guild, and she served there for two, two years. Then she got out and 
started meeting other opportunities through the forums and the sessions that we used to organize. Then, one day Munira calls me. I remember I was in my lab. Munira calls me and tells me I have a book I would wish to publish. And I ask, what is the book about? You know, then she tells me and then we talk and we discuss the journey of publishing. And then Munira publishes a book. Then, uh, sometime last year, around September, Munira tells me she would wish to do something in Masabit where she comes from because she's the first lady in their county to write a book. So she would wish to go back. <laughs> so, Masabit, Masabit County. Masabit County. Yes. Konawazito, guys. So she's the first lady to publish a book in Masabit County. And she tells me, I think I'm feeling something. I would wish to go do something for my society. Then I tell her, Writers Guild, as we have always, we will stand by you. We will go. And so she's planning a book festival or something of that nature in Masabit. So look at that journey. You start as a person. You explore and you discover yourselves. I'm not sure if Munira can perform a poem now the way she used to perform in KU. But, you know, you discover yourselves, then you travel the journey, then now you get to a point when you can be able to reach and, uh, and hold the hand of someone else. I would think that is the journey which we all should think about. Well, as Writers Guild, we also have a publishing segment. That means we receive scripts and we are looking at them and evaluating them. Is it something that is workable? How good is your work? Who can it sell to? And so in, in that regard, we realized that a lot of young writers or upcoming writers or trying writers have a rather, you know, um, we have this, what do I call it? A fallback on with the content and basically the work, the, the, the work, how well, how, how well, how good is our writing? I think they, they already spoke about that, you know, make your writing so good that it's undisputable, yeah. Um, in short, you know we are, we are um, we're in the content era right now, guys, eh? okay? And uh, everything is collapsing together. Um, I, am, I was having difficulty, I didn't get your name, but your travel blog, eh? A lot of traveling that I have seen involves a lot of photography and video, okay? Uh, there's somebody who mentioned about video, um, that I can't remember, there's somebody who mentioned about it and uh, watching, yes, when you talk about the kids, now we are watching things. Um, I own a photography studio and I have had an increase in inquiries about the videos, you know, captioned videos by clients. They want, you know, you watch those videos on Facebook in a seminar that have captions so that you don't hear what somebody is saying, but you can read what they're saying. You get. And what I'm saying is that everything is collapsing together in terms of art, okay? Um, you guys, you still paint on the canvas, but I mean, you can develop your art on Illustrator and other more advanced platforms. Um, spoken word cannot be written. No, we don't quote you also. Eh? Um, <laughs> photography that we are doing, I was telling someone here earlier, if you're doing theatre, um, why aren't those performances being recorded and then being showcased? You know, like over Christmas, a lot of churches and people do Christmas musicals, but you only watch on one station. On, how, why can't they just spread? We have a lot of um, fine artists supporting theatre, fashion supports theatre, uh, photography supporting blogging, uh, a graphic designer I have to do your book and uh, I have to record your trainings on video. Everything is coming together. The other point is um, the advantage of digital media, you can't call it the internet or want to call it social media. We, the knowledge, the IP economy, intellectual property, the writing, the creative mind, those things that the government cannot finds hard to control. They may control the channels sometimes, but you know with the internet, uh, they are still charging guys in Uganda for social media. They, they, they are charging. Yeah, I don't know how they do that. But can you imagine if they did it here, how it would be like? We have the biggest advantage in terms of the medium of digital and social and online. That now we can measure uh, I'm sure that's what, if you ever did a workshop, you would be talking about the measurability, Chris, when you talk about uh, monetizing uh, your online media and all that. We must take advantage of online media in what we do. Because before, if you're somewhere like me back in uh, Nyeri or Narumoro on the slopes, 
and you want to write, there's no internet, there's no Facebook, there is no blog post or there's no WordPress, then how do you go about that? So as we wrap up, I think I want to give uh, everybody a minute um, so that we can wrap up and we have some time to interact. Let's make money. Let's write. If you look at classic writers, we admire them and some are 500 years, 700 years. Every time I start writing something, I ask myself, is this something that someone is going to love on Tuesday and hate on Wednesday? Or how, how is this thing timeless? There are some things that you write and they affect generations. You solve a problem or you write it in a way that you cannot just be ignored by a publisher or a, a media house or a, a creative a, a community. I think the fight in all this is investing in ourselves as writers and as creatives. Let's keep writing our stories uh, and let's keep writing. Thank you. Um, always be inspired. Don't uh, pigeonhole yourself into one type of writing. Go beyond boundaries. Everyone on the panel was given a minute. They took five seconds, so I'm going to take the extra minutes and add it on to mine. So um, the fact that we are all seated here having this conversation is a big step in itself. There's something someone mentioned on how you can, you know, after you, you, you're done with the creative process, you need to switch up gears and get onto the business process. Then after that, you switch gears and become the marketer because you do not have a team. You just have you. You don't really need to do all the switching. You can take it to the next level and be all those, thing, all those things consistently, like co consecutively. Just be all that at the same time. Learn how to speak about your work. Learn how to market yourself. Learn how to sell your products. And that, that, that's how you should think of yourself as a writer. Start selling the book even before it hits a publisher. Each one of you has a phone here. Is a phone a need or is it a luxury? It's a need? Exactly. Thank you. But how did it become a need? Ten years ago, we didn't have... Ten years... Oh, I'm, I'm getting old. But you get what I'm saying. You get what I'm saying. Um, people made the phone become a need. How can you make your content become a need? So that's the question you should be asking yourself. Yeah.